scenes with innocent looking boy kids Mostly white and pure and nothing like you and me And nothing like you and me And nothing like you and me Thank you, music curator Carmen Bita, for, for that opening piece. It's The Push by Dian. Hello and welcome to Food for Thought, a capacity building program at the Athena Advisors, a social enterprise using its knowledge, experience, and connections to assist mission driven organizations by improving their fundraising approach and ability, creating a more equitable, more sustainable world. Food for Thought is a gathering of people who learn from one another in discussing some of the most challenging issues of our time. Our theme today is Black Giving Matters, a conversation on African diaspora giving in partnership with Steve Source, Af Steve Source Africa and Alliance Magazine. Please let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. Thank you. And so I am Diana Angaret, a senior consultant with the Athena Advisors, and I'm really excited to be moderating this panel today on Black philanthropy under the theme Black Giving Matters. My goal today, today is for us to have a great and invigorating discussion on Black philanthropy and to make this conversation as rich as possible. Please have some questions ready, which we shall have a reflection section at the end of the panel discussion. So today we're joined by four amazing panelists and I'm going to introduce our panelists now. I'll start with Delis Wintercon. She is a practitioner, advisor, and a researcher. Her work focuses on building a better infrastructure for black philanthropy to thrive. Delis advises trusts, foundations, and philanthropists in their strategies, roles, and practices in achieving racial equity, including BBC children in need, we Move Fund, and the Funders for Race Equality Alliance. She's a PhD researcher in African philanthropy at SOS University of London. Welcome, dear list, and thank you for joining us. And next, I'll introduce Jacqueline Asimwe. She's a lawyer and, just, and social justice activist, the founder and CEO of CIFSOS Africa, a philanthropy support organization that works to influence philanthropic practice in Africa. Jackie is a chronicler of the untold stories of African generosity and Ubuntu. So welcome, Jackie. And next I'll introduce Halima Mohamed. She's an independent researcher and consultant. 
Her work focuses on advancing the narratives, practice, and impact of philanthropy in Africa through the lenses of power, agency, and social justice. Halima works closely with institutions such as Trust Africa and the Ford Foundation. Welcome, Halima. And finally, I'll introduce Dr. Emma Orupua, who just this week received an honorary degree as a doctor of science at the Liverpool University of Tropical Medicine. Congratulations, Emma. She is the interim director of programs for the Pan-African Mosquito Control Association, a nonprofit she co-founded. She is also a senior consultant at the Athena Advisors and a second generation African diasporan of Nigerian and Seychellian descent. Emma has a passion for supporting Africans to act as agents of change. So thank you for joining us today and you're all really welcome. So we'll get started. So if the planning call to this event was anything to, to go by, I think we're in for a great time. So like I mentioned before, our reflection section will follow at the end of the panel discussion. So please refrain from using the chat during the panel discussion so that we can save all our questions for the reflection section and uh, your thoughts and experiences that come to mind as we have the conversation. So I bet you're all wondering what constitutes black giving. So I'm going to turn it over to Emma and to explain to us, what do you understand by diaspora giving? Thank you, Diana. And it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. So I think it's helpful to break down the two terms, diaspora and giving. So diaspora simply means people who are located away from their established or ancestral homeland. Um, and the giving to me is really uh, looking at how diaspora use their time, talent and treasure to further social causes and the well-being of others. In this context, um, African diaspora um, Africans are uh, often through involuntary or voluntary methods migrate to other countries um, they may be students, refugees, uh, economic migrants um, and they uh, uh, have this connection between their destination country and the country of um, heritage. And so I think it's really important to have this conversation today as the diaspora are often overlooked within philanthropy um, and have a lot to give. Um, and there are various forms of capital that the diaspora has. So we often focus on remittances, which are really important, but wider than the financial capital, the diaspora also gives in terms of their intellectual capability, there's political capital, cultural and social capital too. So I think this uh, discussion is really timely to really um, shine a light on, on the different ways in which we can engage diaspora. And certainly within the um, NGO sphere, um, there are many opportunities to understand that the diaspora have various uh, forms of, of giving to share. Um, and these need to be capitalized on um, to support initiatives that are happening back on the continent. So that's how I'll, I'll start there, just my um, understanding. But I will say that it's complex. Um, identity is um, often layered. Um, and some of us have really uh, complicated uh, lineages. So although we talk about African diaspora and we might interchange it with black people, there are many people on the African content, continent that have lineages to other subcontinents too. So it's really important to be inclusive in this. Um, but uh, I think that this uh, conversation is very timely, given that there is a paradigm shift within philanthropy and diaspora um, engagement is really evolving. And there are trends and patterns that I think that organizations that work in the global south can be uh, capitalizing on to have more impactful change um, in, in their countries of operation. Thank you, Emma, so much for that lovely introduction and breaking down what diaspora giving means. So I'm going to turn this over to the rest of the panelists. What do you, what do you understand about diaspora giving? What does black giving mean to you? And 
how do you think it differs from other types of giving and philanthropy? Just feel free to go, whoever wants to go first. Sorry, um, quickly, um, <clears throat> just to add to um, Emma, you were saying I completely um, agree in terms of um, you know, the gas we're giving, you know, about intellectual capital, you know, the social capital that we bring um, alongside the remittances. Um, what I see is that, you know, the remittance part, um, not to do away with that because it's fundamental. A lot of conversation on diaspora giving, specifically African diaspora giving, has looked at, um, you know, the contribution or has asked how much are they giving? You know, remittances last year were at uh, 53 billion, you know, that we know. Um, and that's put it mildly. And that's an increase of 5% on the previous year. And despite a global economic price crisis, and I think what that shows is that, you know, African diaspora, we are giving, you know, we're giving in huge numbers. And it's a strong indic indicator that much more needs to be done to understand that. If we look at, say, African philanthropy itself, so that difference between the giving of remittances and philanthropic giving, um, it's at 7 billion. And that we don't understand. So when I think about what I understand of Africa diaspora giving is absolutely everything that you said, Emma. And I see that, you know, there's a need to do more of it. We need more of it. We need to better understand it, um, you know, to research it, um, not to evidence it, but to research it to see how we can better utilise it and also build a better ecosystem for it to flourish. Um, a lot of it is very much based on um, networks and is affinity based. And how do you think it, it differs from other types of philanthropy, in your opinion, Dallas? Yeah, how it differs. I mean, there are all different types of philanthropy. I guess how it differs, if I can think of an example, um, here in the UK, in England, how it differs is um, there's a fund I've been working on, advising on, and it's the only fund in the UK that is specific to funding black children and young people, um, the only fund in the UK. Okay. So when you ask how it differs, um, that in and of itself is how it differs. Um, it shows that um, black giving or giving to uh, black communities is under invested in, um, is seldom understood, and there isn't um, enough um, partnership or actors really um, in the game. Okay. Thank you for that. Halema, would you like to chip in? Yeah, thank you, Diana. Yeah, I think that we have to, when we talk about Black giving and Black diaspora giving, I think we have to start with whose narrative of giving decides what giving is and isn't. And we've been conditioned by a Western narrative that has been narrow and it's been exclusionary. And so it's really important that we start to assert our own narratives of what does Black giving look like first, and then what does Black diaspora giving look like? Um, and there is a little bit of work being done on that, but there much more needs to be done just to understand and better reflect this. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that there can be multiple narratives. So the organic everyday giving can lie side by side and often does with the structured professionalized giving. The one-to-one -one giving can coexist with the institutional um, it's important also to recognize that there needs to be diversity, plurality, and interwovenness in how we understand African giving and how it's expressed. When it comes to diaspora, it's a, it's a complex, um, it's a, it's a complex com conversation, and I'll leave the definitional elements to those, you know, who, whose field this is. But, you know, for me, um, I was born in South Africa. Um, some of my grandparents were born here. So I'm South African, full stop. That's how I identify. My parents identified as South Africans of Indian descent, and they had much stronger ties to um, the Asian continent. Um, my family members uh, at their level um, had set up a fund and would send money to India, um, to the space, that, to the village that they were born from, for infrastructure, for many other things. Um, I don't. Um, and if I give, I think of, if I give to the Asian subcontinent, um, I think of it just as normal philanthropy. I don't think of it as me being a diaspora giving. And so I think these are complex, with multiple identities, and these are complex conversations that uh, we have to think much more 
um, definitionally. And I think there's a this subjective element in here that, that we have to think about. I think the last thing I would say is that there are multiple ways to understand diaspora giving. Um, and it, it's agreed, it's not just the financial, but it's also um, the, the everyday um, acts that are embedded in our cultures, in our traditions, which we don't think about as philanthropy. And we have to start, uh, we have to start changing the narrative of what we call philanthropy. You know, there's a lot of uh, narratives going around that are exclusionary that kind of say, oh, well, you know, that's just charity or, oh, well, that's just your culture. But when you start to look at the giving behaviors that exist within African societies and you start to analyze them from a different perspective, you see that these are giving behaviors where people are volunteering their time, their effort, their assets, um, multiple other resources for public good. And it's never called that. And, and some of that gets taken over in diaspora philanthropy, and we have to start broadening that conversation. I think we can talk a lot more uh, later on about that, but I, I'd start with that. Okay, thank you so much. And Jackie, would you like to let, let us know what you think of Black giving and diaspora giving? Ah, oh. so when I think about Black giving and the reason why we're even having this conversation is to center it, is to be aware of it, is to talk about it, is to celebrate it, is to honor it, is to understand it, is to be curious about it. Um, three About three years ago, when CivSource did our first gathering of givers, the theme at that time was count, recount, account. And I think when I think of Black giving, uh, that theme comes to mind. Counting means, or, or as we expressed it then, was Black giving counts. Because often in the world that we, in the globalized world that we live in, in the hierarchized world that we live in, Blackness, Black giving, <laughs> Black anything really is usually at the bottom of the rung. So us saying Black giving matters or Black giving counts means that it is something we're not even comparing how much is it and whose is more. No, no, it is, it counts. However much it is, in whatever ways it is done, it counts. And also that every giving counts. So um, Emma talked about time, treasure, and talent, assets, whatever it is, every giving count from one penny to a million pennies, every giving count counts. And then to Halima's point about narrative, we talked about recounting. So telling the myriad of stories, because I don't think they are told enough. And indeed, um, as, as the other panelists have said, you know, it's not researched enough. The stories are not told enough. Um, and so for me, the reason that this conversation is important is to recount the countless stories of Black giving through the ages. Um, and in fact, when we're preparing for this conversation, we even said through the generations, because how first generation givers give is different from how young givers give right now. So all of those, I think, count. And then to account was to say, what are the structures? What are the forms that um, accountability can be done? So yes, there's counting the 53 billion. How do we account for, for time, for intellect? How do we begin to put value um, to those kinds of giving, because they too count, and how do we account for that time, for that energy, that effort that is embedded when Black people give, both from the from outside the continent, but also within the continent, because there are displaced peoples within our continents, and they too are giving back to their home countries as well. Thank you so much. That was that was really lovely to listen, interesting to listen to. But um, I wanted to go back to you, Halema. You, I'd like for you to describe to us. You said you were you 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 don't necessarily relate to diaspora giving the way maybe Emma would. And then I'd like to know how does why do you think it's so different for you? Why do you think you it's different for you the way you view it? from what Emma would say diaspora giving is. You're muted. Yeah. 
so like I said, my, my, um, you know, my lineage comes from the Asian subcontinent, right? But if I were to move to the UK tomorrow and give to the African continent, I would count myself on the African diaspora giving, right? So for me, wow. the notion of identity is, is, is different. I, I don't see my giving to the Asian subcontinent as diaspora giving. I just, you know, see that as giving. But if I were to move out of my country, or out of my continent, then then I would count my my giving here as um, diaspora giving. So I just think that it's a, you know, where does it start and end is a complex conversation and needs to be had in context. Um, I don't think it's clear cut. Is uh, is what I'm saying there. Okay. okay, I understand. So Jackie, from your from your chronicling of the stories of from generations and and what you've been able to to learn from learning about philanthropy in the African way, how do you think it's different from other types of philanthropy? And do you see influences from other cultures that to be say to be different from the way black people give or are there similarities and things of that sort? So I think where I start from is that to give is human. You know, there are certain things that whatever you're color whatever your race whatever your uh, continent to give is human and i think when when we when we preface it with black giving like i said it's only to highlight that in a hierarchized world where um and and coming from <laughs> a continent that was heavily colonialized colonized not colonialized co co colonized where everything African was relegated to the bottom, where we received um, from those that colonized us uh, a narrative that said theirs was better, which meant that a lot of what we did was disappeared, was ignored, was relegated, was legislated away. Um, to have this conversation is to say, it may not even necessarily be different, but it is there. Can we first agree it's there, right? And mm -hmm. then yes, it may be different because indeed the things that that the you know the 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 the, the um, issues that the Africans face on the continent are different. The issues that our ethnicities face, the different the things that our villages face might be different um, from others in other continents. And so that too is to recognize. What is the nuance? And it's to recognize it not as a better than or less than, it's just to say it too has a place. So one, it's to say black giving exists because to give is human, but also to say, and there might be nuances depending on what is given. And we heard one nuance um, from one of the panelists, the things that we are concerned about, that we care about are different because of the history, the context is what we were talking about of Africa and our experiences as a continent and as a continent in the globalized world. So yes, there will be differences. Just one example that um, a friend of mine from South Africa actually tells me about when she talks about a Ugandan there who is famous for giving. And what does he do? When other Ugandans come into South Africa, one of the things he does, uh, because it's a very interesting and different geography and, and jurisdiction to navigate. He gives people, you know, Ugandans that are coming in shelter. He um, gives them advice about where to go and where to get jobs and where to apply for school and where to, and that's his form of giving because he knows that to come into a context that you do not understand is, is, is alienating. And so that is his form of giving. And, and there, you know, there are many, I'm sure, that, that happen like that. So, so that's how I'd answer that. Is it, is it different? Yes, it might be, but we're not even comparing better than, less than, no. It's different mm -hmm. context. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does any of other of our panelists like to weigh in? Um, just to support what Jackie's saying. Um, I've worked in African facing organizations in the past. And when you don't have a significant contingent of diaspora on the staff, on the board, 
the way of looking at giving is very myopic. And I remember being in a conversation once with the fundraising team and they said, well, we don't target the diaspora because the diaspora doesn't give. And I was shocked to hear this because their way of looking at givers was, okay, let's have Razor's Edge, let's have a list of um, high net worth individuals that have colonial ties to, to Africa. Um, and so not really having that broad definition or, or characterization of what the diaspora is. And then when we look at generations, as, as a previous panelist said, there's, there's different granularity. So my parents were first generation, used to giving money in a brown envelope, Western Union, sending money for funerals, um, weddings, education. Whereas second generation and successive generations um, give for different reasons and have different motivations. Um, and a lot of it is linked to, you know, an emotional connection or social capital. Lots of us are wanting to invest in the continent and buy land and build houses. So it's not just a kind of um, homogenous block with the diaspora. We have to understand the differences between generations um, and also uh, different emotional drivers, um, as Halima mentioned, and our sense of identity. Um, when we think about uh, black people in America, they won't, might not necessarily have a specific country unless they do their DNA analysis, but there are growing uh, swathes of people that want to reconnect with the continent and want to go back and, and learn. So it's really complex. And in order to be able to target diaspora groups, we need to do the research, get some cultural intelligence um, and really break it down. And it's a very complicated, um, layered phenomena but it's worth tapping into because the treasures of the diaspora are vast um, and when I go to different institutions and, and visit different NGOs and they're doing work in Africa it makes me feel slightly um, anxious when I don't see any Africans in the organization because um, how do you know what you're doing is is you know culturally sensitive do you understand the social and cultural norms um, and there's a lot of uh, information, knowledge about idiosyncrasies that can be um, shared to make the giving more um, impactful in, in, the, in these countries and on the continent. And so this is really what Jackie was saying is about, let's just count it. Let's just see that it's there. That's step one. And many organizations that are African facing don't even want to think about the diaspora. It's too complicated. We don't know how to reach them. Well, if you do the research and you involve people from those countries in your organizations, then you'll have a, a wealth of knowledge to be able to understand lifestyle and, and uh, target your diaspora engagement strategies so that they can be meaningful and, and sustainable. Um, and a lot of African diaspora um, individuals choose not to engage with Western organizations because of lack of trust. Where is my money going? Is it going into the pockets of a CEO or money is being wasted on jollies. I'd rather give funding direct, directly to my relative or to my community. And by understanding that, you know, there's different ways of giving, whether it be alumni networks, professional associations, um, church, mosque, all of this happens and it happens um, to such a large scale, but we don't count it. We don't understand the who, the why and the where. Um, and if we did that more, then we'd be able to have um, much more significant impact. And I feel that African diaspora would engage. I'm still more likely to send money to relatives or go through an intermediary. So how do we build those trusted intermediaries? And a few of us here have worked with Afford, shout out to Afford, amazing organization um, that, that works with African diaspora and they've kind of got it right because they, have built that trust with, with countries and individuals. And so um, working to build the capacity and fund organizations that are doing the work, that understand how to do the work in an impactful way is really, really important. Thank you, Thank you Emma, here. Um, I think it's, it's important, you know, what do we center is really important. So I don't wanna try and fit blood giving into the notion of philanthropy. I want to fit the dominant understanding of top-down structured philanthropy into the broader notion of back giving because it's not exclusive. So 
there are multiple manifestations. People give through organized structures. They give through Heineck Worth Foundations. They give to corporate foundations, but they give in so many other ways. So I think that the, the it's not about comparing. It's about saying that where we start is matters. You know, if we start with the Western version or narrative of what philanthropy look like, looks like, and then we try to compare, it doesn't work because there are fundamental differences in how we understand giving. So we have to start by saying, this is what we understand as giving. This is where the institutionalized, professionalized models of giving fit within our cultures and our context, but they're only one part. And then we have to show what all of those other parts are, the organic, the individuals, the to friends, extended family, neighbors. I mean, when you talk to Western organizations and they do these counts of who's the most giving society, they ask, how many times have you given to a stranger in the last six months? Now, we on the African continent know that when you give to your neighbor or someone in your community, they're not a stranger, but it's counted. It should be counted as philanthropy, but it's not counted by Western standards. And so we have to ask different questions when we're having these conversations, but we also have to go beyond money, right? Um, so it's about lending of assets, productive assets, it's called ukusisa in Zulu, where you borrow productive assets so people can make use of those, and then they give it back to you once they have the value from those productive assets. It's about things like voluntary work to help the ill, which is called onjami in Nama, from peer-to-peer -peer rotating and saving schemes, you know, we have many words for those, tontines, harambis, um, uh, uh, merry-go-rounds, to pool labor during harvest time, which is called Obwirano in Malawi. We need to start talking about these terms. We need to start talking about what they mean to us and start valuing for what they are. We don't want to, and we don't need to do a monetary equivalent because then we buy into a different narrative of what counts. We need to start valuing it for what it is, for how it contributes to solidarity, to mutuality, to, to our social lives and our communal lives and start putting different metrics of value on those kinds of things. And I think diaspora giving happens through all of those different kinds of things. It's in the village associations, it's in the professionalized societies, it's in the remittances. And, and we need to have a conversation about remittances because increasingly I hear people say, oh no, remittances are just people sending money home to their family. But many people understand that their family survival is embedded with their community survival and they send money home to things that benefit both. But when you count remittances, you never count that. So I think we need to have a different conversation around what do we mean by remittances and the philanthropic elements within remittances. I think those are really, really important. And then the last one, I think Jackie, you mentioned was about, um, you know, what about the diaspora giving in country? So we have this documented evidence of Malawian and Senegalese societies in South Africa and how the mutual support networks um, are what make South Africa is such an attractive place for Malawians and Senegalese to come to because they know that there are philanthropic networks. We don't call them philanthropic networks, but they are in essence philanthropic networks of other Malawians and Senegalese who help them when they get there. But no way in the documentation that I've seen has it been called philanthropy. And so we have to turn this notion on its head. Thank you so much, Emma and Halema. You've actually led me to the last, almost last part of our discussion, which is what is the way forward for African philanthropy? What do you see as the way forward? Jackie, I see you nodding your head. Do you have any ideas of what's the way forward? I know you're making that path right now. It'd be lovely to hear from you. So, you know, like you introduced to me, I, I, I love stories, I'm a chronicler. And if we could even just start there to begin to tell the stories of all the ways and, and how we collect those stories, of course, will also be different. But, uh, you know, a part of the, of the as we were leading up to this conversation today, we started to think one, of course, in a one hour conversation, we cannot tell the swath of black giving, um, but also what can we do after this, after today? And for me, storytelling is very important uh, that we start to name it, we start to see it, we start to celebrate it, we start to, um, wherever it happens. Um, and for me, I think that would be one way. 
uh, and that's different from the academic research that of course must happen, um, you know, to understand the nuances, the depth, the width, the breadth. Uh, but for me, just how do we create a repository of story upon story, both to celebrate what was, what is to come, but also as a way to enable the world to see all that Black giving is. Yeah, I think the repository point, uh, yeah, right on cue, uh, Jacqueline, you know, absolutely need that, um, you know, the repository of, you know, knowledge and also connection, you know, and knowledge in terms of showing who's doing what, you know, platforming stories, platforming what works, you know, and platforming also how we unlock capital, you know, um, that piece about, um, you know, who's investing in what. You know, traditionally, you know, we've looked at institutions or individuals, but there's something about, um, you know, social investment and how we actually look at um, intergenerational wealth. Um, in terms of key questions and the way forward, so um, the question that's come out here is how do we build better value systems in intellectual and social capital? You know, um, I think the space has been created. I'd be interested to hear from the panelists on this. Because I sit in here in the UK um, you know, over the last two and a half years, um, it seems like COVID-19, Black Lives Matter has created a perfect storm almost where racial equity, um, shift the power movement and social justice philanthropy really started to show itself. And here in the UK, we're talking about, oh, is that space shrinking? Um, I think, you know, when, you know, way forwards after this is for us to start those conversations, start connecting with each other to build that system, you know, because philanthropy isn't, um, it's, a ma it's not a magic bullet, we shouldn't see it as that or, you know, even giving, you know, but to see these as an enabler and to be um, a bit riskier with it and start to see um, new models. I think there's also a way forward, there's something about um, ministries. Um, when I mean, I mean government ministries on the African continent, quite a few diaspora ministries have propped up and they could have an interesting role to play here as a conduit of bringing different communities together, as well as being a facilitator in building that infrastructure. Well, thank you so much, our panelists, for this interesting discussion. Thank you, Patricia, for your for that report. I did read it, it was really good. So right now I'd like to open the floor for everybody to uh, give us their opinions, their questions, your experiences with Black philanthropy. Um, this is your time now. Hi, sorry, I didn't know whether I should speak. <laughs> Raise my yeah. hand. Oh yes, sorry. <laughs> I I I am actually uh, quite confused with this conversation because we are having two separate conversations. So my name is Chibwani Nui. I'm based in the UK. I'm a co-founder of One World Together and I've run a diaspora organization and I've worked for Comic Relief. And I'm actually a multi organizer for fundraising management at Queen Mary School of Business and Management. So we're having a conversation where issues of identity have not been unpicked. We've mentioned so much about identity. So when we, I understand that the organizers are based in the US. So a lot of definition around who we are is around black. I am a Zambian in the UK, I'm not black. I am an African. And if we talk about the Zimbabweans and the Malawans in South Africa, we are changing the language to diaspora giving. Then we again, we are confusing it with black giving. What are we actually talking about? Yeah, because I'm looking at this report signed off by the Arts Council and it's encouraging black giving. You understand? Black is a definition that we did not give ourselves. We are called black for some issue. It's the same, it's like nobody can say my name, but they can say, is it just Jaskowski or whatever his name is? Everybody can say that. You can't even like make it a shortcut. You have to say it properly. So I'm trying to challenge this room to say, we are having a conversation about the what. Let's count the money, let's do this. Where's the why? If we don't understand why we give as Africans, as Africans in America, my husband's from Antigua. So I know I am Zambian, desperate, the UK, he's black African, he's black in the UK. So I understand the complexities, 
But this illusion of complexity where we can't find the time to unpick our own identity, how then do we start talking about how we give? Do you understand what I mean? So I think we have the ability to unpick this because black giving, diaspora giving is not one thing. Somebody already mentioned it's very complex. Where's the complexity here? Are we putting it in a pot? What are we? Do you understand? So I'm sitting here listening and I'm hearing elements of culture. I'm hearing elements of the, and then the language changes. I'm like, what are we doing without understanding the why or going on to the what? It means we are literally talking about, you, you know, defining ourselves again with terminologies that we did not give ourselves, we did not define. How do we transform, understand how we give? If we cannot even define it within our own terminology, our own culture of giving, who generates that knowledge? Who builds that? I don't want to go on, but I, this is why I'm stuck here until we can define, because if this, this event for me should have been diaspora giving, African diaspora giving, because that's the focus, isn't it? Literally, that's our focus. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. And if we're going to put in the black, we need to be really careful. Just because the British Council acts whatever signed off black doesn't make me black. You understand? This is really, really important. And that's my challenge to this room. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a lot to think about. We did have that um, conversation between diaspora and Black and African because it's, it is a lot to put in one conversation. And we just thought, let's just have a conversation and then see where it goes from there. But thank you so much. So anybody else? I see Harbi. Yes, Harbi. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much. It was it, it was insightful. Obviously, I I completely understand the challenges of you know addressing something that's so big, and we we always need more time. Maybe a whole day, or or maybe a whole day wouldn't even you know take it all apart. So, um, I want to kind of bring it back uh, to some of the points that Emma was mentioning about. And organizations, whether it's foundations and charities focusing on, on Razor's Edge and focusing on, you know, families who have colonial ties or who have, you know, a passion or love for Africa rather than actually reaching out to um, African diaspora or Black diasporas who, who can actually give, give to Africa effectively. Is this because there isn't a may Emma, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot, sorry, because we, we've met. <laughs> but Emma, do you think this is... This is due to the lack of diversity within fundraising, within within the fundraising landscape. And how can we tackle that um, if we want to get more, more people to, to give um, who are who are black, who are African, who, who are Caribbean, etc.? Yeah, I do think it's because there's lack of diversity. And I think going back to what Jackie was saying, um understanding who gives and why and the drivers and I take on board your point Chibwe as well about identity it's very layered I identify myself as African diaspora and I think black is a very loaded term and um, and probably use more kind of out you know for people that are kind of have uh, more generations in between the migration and, and those of the continent and so absolutely it's very important and it's it can be very individual as well um, and it can be fluid. Sometimes I say I'm black. Sometimes I say I'm out of African heritage, depending on how I feel and the, the environment and the context that I'm in. But absolutely um, agree with your point. I think fundraising does need to be more diversified. Um, one of the reasons why I signed up for the Athena Advisors Racing Upwards program was to understand, um, to get exposure to, to fundraising. Uh, most organizations that I've worked with, the fundraising team has been all white. If there has been um, a black fundraiser, they've stayed for a very short period of time and left because they haven't felt listened to, they felt excluded and, and marginalized. So by understanding drivers, why we give um, motivations um, and really demonstrating that 
organizations are giving in a way that's aligned with that, then more black people will be compelled to join the, the profession. Um, one of the reasons I moved away from that was it, I just wasn't feeling it, to be honest. Um, I was in that space and um, the approaches, the strategies are very formulaic. They weren't um, in line with how I understood diaspora to be engaging with the countries and continent of heritage. So there needs to be a lot more learning, but also it could be um, how do we build the capacity of already established organizations that are doing the work, African diaspora organizations, and how do we um, ensure that more funding is channeled towards those organizations? Because they know what to do and they, they're doing the work. Um, so we, we shouldn't automatically be focused on that, that Western model because it doesn't work for many of us um, when we get disenfranchised with it. Okay, thank you. And um, we'll have a question from Patricia Reflection and then Robin. So Patricia, then Robin. Hi, I, I just wanted to come back on the um, the discussion around the use of the word and term black for part of this discussion. Um, I, I, I just wanted to do really highlight the fact that we consciously in, in publishing and doing the research and publishing the report I shared, um, we did, it was a political decision to use the term black because at least in the UK, uh, very specifically, um, there has been a real reluctance in almost all conversations around racial equity and racial justice to talk about black communities in this country. Um, you know, we labored under the you know, acronym of BAME and, and, and then it's about the diverse communities and so many other things, but it's been very uncomfortable for people to talk about black communities here. The other reason why we did was because in Britain, there is a, 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 a multitude of, of, of communities. Um, some have directly African heritage. Um, some come from the Caribbean, obviously is still part of the diaspora, but, but often black British um, uh, citizens here, people here off sometimes feel left out of the conversation. So we, that's one of the reasons why we also um, purposefully politically chose to use the term black. And the other thing I would like to say is um, one in two of black children in this country live in poverty, that's a fact. And when I, when, when we did this research and when we talked to those people of African heritage or not even her heritage, Africans living in Britain, um, m many of them, as was discussed here, do give and a lot, large part of what they can give back to their home countries, you know, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, you know, other countries where they come from. They absolutely do give and want to support the communities back in their home. But they also give some substantive, some you know, percentages of their funding and their philanthropy, their gifts to this country because they recognize that, that there is a impact on the diaspora community in this country. As again, one in two black children in this country live in poverty. They see that and they need a way of being able to channel their, their giving, um, their support to this country um, very directly. That is not necessarily touches on diaspora, but is not necessarily directly tied to what is going back on back in their home country. So those are just the dimensions which I do think we should consider. And I think you could have a similar conversation in, in other geographies that have, a, you know, a large diaspora, African diaspora population as well. But that's all. Thank you so much, Robin. So I, I have loved this conversation and um, thank all of the contributions. And the question I have is, to our panelists, uh, as someone who thinks about the profession of fundraising, what would you like to, how would you like to have your background and perspective inform and, and shape and enlarge the profession of fundraising? What, what does the profession need that you have to observe, that you have to offer? What, what can be done that is different and that is better, that, is enlar that enlarges this profession? Yeah, um, in my background, I came from a fundraising background, um, also international development background, you know, in terms of um, what Emma was talking about, um, really the tension, um, the barriers, um, feeling disenfranchised, you know, I've seen all of that. In terms of what can be done, um, well, currently we, we have um, different bodies talking about how we better engage the diaspora, you know, and what that Right, right now looks like is we have this great product 
um, for how do we engage the diaspora on it, where I see it should be the other way around. It should be the diaspora at the table designing that product, you know, itself, not um, being involved in something that's already completed. Um, for me, what needs to happen in fundraising, what would have been great to, you know, be in departments of 65, where I'm the only black person, you know, walking to philanthropic, you know, meetings, the only black person. Um, it starts, and we keep saying it starts at the top. I, I think it's, it's about representation, um, having more people of colour, having more African diaspora within organisations at all levels of the organisation itself, um, being involved in the design of a strategy, a fundraising strategy, because once you've got um, us African diaspora at the table, the conversation is different, you know, the product is different, you know, um, and you won't necessarily have that um, one size fits all solution that um, here in the West and um, we're very used to, you know, this, um, you know, fundraising model works, um, let's take it and work. You know, same with um, international development programs, for instance, or the WASH, for instance. Um, yeah, what can be done differently? Have the, the people, the communities that you're talking about and are there to serve at the table at the beginning and at all levels of the organization. Okay. One thing I remembered. <clears throat> oh, sorry, was somebody else going? No, 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 okay. it's you. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, this term driving while black. Uh, I think we should take that to fundraising, asking while well Black, and what that difference creates. Uh, like somebody said here, that, 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 you know, organizations that can will have Caucasian people do the asking, because a white person may trust another white person. So asking while well Black, I think, has its nuances which when we're taught fundraising writ large if it doesn't take that into account mm -hmm. i think misses something because we come to the table if you even get to the table anyway so access is also a very big thing mm -hmm. but once at the table i mean you come with the issues of can we trust this melanin can we you know you come already with stereotypes about who you are what you'll do mm -hmm. and corruption in Africa as if it's only exists in Africa you know and so asking while black and what does that mean and mm. look like when we frame it for fundraising mm. and then of course the layers asking while black and a woman well, ask, asking while black and a woman and disabled asking while black and you do not know English mm. um and and you know the, the many layers of, of of identity that we've talked about yeah asking well okay. black and you didn't go to school but you need to ask so and i know that we've had the conversations even as you think about shifting power of is is the written form the only way to ask for money can i tell a story can i sing a song can i do it in a poem can i what else can i do mm -hmm. that also because i think fundraising and and power discussing and talking about power because that's what it is you come to me um or I grant you access to my table. Uh, so what is it like for, you know, to, to change that and to center power when we have these conversations? I will keep quiet for now. Okay. I, Thank you I so much. In, oh, I, I think there, there are two things. Um, I mean, I don't come from the fundraising sector at all. I've been in the philanthropy space all my working life, but not on the, not on the other side. But, uh, there are some parallels um, to this conversation and the story, the narrative has to be defined by us. If we want to talk about African diaspora giving, then the conversations must be framed by those we're talking about. The knowledge building must be done by those we're talking about and the definitions need to be our own, the definitions need to be contextualized. I think that what's been the problem is that we keep feeding conversations into parameters that have already been defined externally and that's a big problem. The second thing is, uh, you know, if we're talking about fundraising, if you don't understand what, what are the different manifestations of people giving, how then um, can you really fundraise? And maybe fundraise is not the right word because fundraise reduces it to money. And I think that's another discussion to be had. So I remember going to a very large, what was usually a very well-attended national um, every year conference 
and uh, this man came in and gave a master class on fundraising and he's like oh what are you worrying about the five and ten dollars that is just wasting your time focus on the old women who are about to die the old widows who are about to die because that's where your money is going to come from and I was horrified you know but that has stuck with me ever since because that's a framing that's a framing of what's important what's value is if I think about what many African diaspora are giving their giving looks so different right and in so many different ways and if we don't understand what the different ways of giving looks like it's not just the money it's all the other things then we can't begin to support it strengthen it tap into it and I think the last thing I would say is not everything has to be professionalized uh, we have to recognize and this shouldn't be our decision but we have to recognize by working with those we're talking about about where they want strengthening and where they want support and what should just be left alone. Some things are organic and they work because they're organic. And the minute we try to formalize them, we destroy them. And that's really important. Okay, thank you, Halema. I think we're coming to the end of our time together. And I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. And I believe this conversation has been insightful and educational. And I'd like to thank all our panelists for all the knowledge and wisdom they've, sh they've shared with us. And so I would like to invite Lucy, our Director of Plant Services, who has done a brilliant job bringing all this together to make the closing remarks. Thanks, Diana, and thanks everyone uh, for being here. December is a busy time for many of us for varied reasons, and um, it's, it's a really important hour that we've shared. Um, so truly thank you all for joining us. Um, and to our partners, um, Civ Source Africa and Alliance, um, and especially, most especially to our panelists um, and to Diana, our moderator, who has done a beautiful job. Um, so just to very briefly touch on uh, Racing Upwards, which Em mentioned, um, the application window is open for our 2023 cohort. Um, Emma, Dr. Emma, um, and Diana, um, our moderator, were actually our 2022 Racing Upwards Fellows. Um, and I'm clicking share now. Um, so you can learn more about the Racing Upwards Fellowship on our website, which I've just popped in the chat. Um, if you think you might know someone um, who could be our uh, 2023 Racing Upward Fellow, um, then do send them our way. Um, and it's a really great educational opportunity to a professional involved, uh, interested in their fundraising skills. Um, and we particularly invite um, professionals from communities of colour to enlarge the number of voices at the table in non-profit organisations and boards. Um, and Carmen Bita, our music curator, who will shortly be um, offering us our closing piece uh, was also a Racing Upwards Fellow um, just a few years back. And um, so in 2023, we also have a couple of exciting um, food for thought themes. Um, so we've got one on digital marketing for nonprofits, um, a masterclass um, with Pauline Kwasniak of Fine Deeds. So that's in February. Um, and we have one on engaging ideas. So that's on inclusion, diversity, equity, and access um, with Michelle Bergsman. Um, in April. And again, I will pop that in the chat. I'm multitasking. Um, our LinkedIn events has um, all of the information you need um, and hope to welcome you um, to one or two or all of those. Um, so I'm now over to Carmen um, with the closing music, um, The Book of Love by Peter Gabriel. And apologies, we've run over by a moment or two, but Everyone had such important insights. Um, hopefully it was worth worth your time. So thanks all so much for joining us. Um, over to you, Carmen. <laughs>
of charts and facts and figures and instructions for dancing but I Just really dumb. But... 